with the squad, mess up with the squad, with the squad, mess up one of us, you ain't messing with my vision. What's up guys? Welcome to NFD TV No More Defeats TV. All we do is win, never take it any losses, and shout out. Shout out to all my bosses. Okay, guys, we got a jam-packed Thursday night. A lot of good things happening. I got to give some shout outs real quick. First of all, shout out to the Patreon squad. David Settles, Kurt Van Horn. Shout out to the newest member of the Patreon squad, T. Davis, Michelle Allen, and JT Sports. Remember, guys, the link for the Patreon squad is in the description. If you sign up for that, you get access to the podcast, exclusive content. You get content early, and you get to be in the private live stream and the 24-7 group chat that's about to pop off once the season starts. So get signed up, and it helps me become a full-time content creator. That is my goal. I'm putting it out there. I really want to talk college football 24-7. So get signed up and help your boy out. Already some uh, contributions via Super Chat. So we got to give a shout out to DeAndre Crawford, T. Davis, and Vernon Speak Sports Auburn. Guys, I appreciate it. Every little dime I get, I appreciate it, man. It means a lot. I'm going to keep grinding. I'm going to keep shining. We got JT Sports in the house. JT and... um. Vernon Speak Sports, both of those guys have YouTube channels. Um, um, go and check them out and subscribe. Shout out to JT for um putting uh for uh for sharing the video. I appreciate that, JT man. Both of those guys um have helped me out a ton since I've been on YouTube, and I appreciate it a lot. Let me let's go ahead and see if I can do this. We got a lot going on today. We're talking about Auburn football, and we're going to talk about the Georgia Bulldogs. Let's get JT Sports. All right, so this first link, guys, is th that's that's the channel to JT Sports. He does college and the NFL. Give him a uh, a check, and then we're gonna throw Vernon Speak Sports. Now Vernon is, is actually our one of our guests tonight, so um, you definitely want to subscribe to um, to his channel. You'll you will you will learn that this guy he knows college football, he knows Auburn football, and uh, me and him we got a good a good dynamic. We go back and forth. So those are two channels, guys. Go ahead and check them out. Subscribe to them. You know what I'm saying? Uh, make sure you hit that like video. Um, guys, a lot is going on with the channel, man. If you haven't, if you haven't noticed, not only have I continued the um the uploads, but now I'm starting to really venture out and bring more people into the fold to talk about their teams, to do more live streams. Um, I talked to a lot of people that follow me, a lot of people that support the channel, and they said, hey, we'd love to, for you to do more live streams and things like that. So I'm definitely doing that. Um, and that and, and the, the content ain't going to stop. The grind ain't going to stop. We got Captain Trips in the house. He says, "Who's going to start at quarterback for Auburn?" Well, when when um when Vernon gets on the line, we'll definitely that'll be one of the first questions I ask him because it's a good one. It's one of those quarterback battles that um you got two young quarterbacks. You got the um the hot shot Bo Nix, and then you got Joey Gatewood. People saying he's the next Cam Newton. We'll find out. Um, DeAndre says Kelly Bryant should have went to Auburn or Arkansas. I don't know how he would have fit into Auburn's system. 
If he would have went to Arkansas, you, you don't have a lot of talent around you at Arkansas. You got you to gotta remember that. Missouri, they got some talent, but Arkansas, they're changing their whole thing. You know, uh, if, if I was him, I probably would have went to Auburn or um, – I probably would have went to Auburn or um, or Missouri was a good one because he wants to go pro, and I think um, I think the coach at Missouri, even though that they're on the postseason ban, they're going to try to get it. They're going to try to get it um, redone or whatever, but they're not going to. But he's going to be able to put out a good. Uh, one year's full of tape. You look at what Missouri did with Drew Locke and his progression. So that's what Kelly Bryant saw. And I think he'll do good. So we got one question. Give me some questions that you guys would like for me to ask about Auburn football. And uh, we'll definitely we'll get it asked. Um, also, after this, um after this we got georgia bulldog talk with josh from the late kick josh does uh great work with the late kick and so we'll we'll talk auburn football for to about eight something uh eight fifty ish then we'll we'll actually end the stream come back We'll have it set up for the uh, Georgia Bulldogs stream. T. Davis said, I think Brian chose Missouri to prepare him for the NFL. That offensive coordinator is fire. I agree. Like I said, look what they did with Drew Locke and his progression. And honestly, now, if you look at it, it probably worked out the best because if you go to an Auburn, if you go to an Auburn, um, there's going to be pressure on you in the SEC and Auburn. There's going to be pressure. There's not going to be a lot of pressure for you in the first place at Missouri, but it, it's definitely not going to be pressure now that they got that postseason ban. So he can he can actually, you know, I'm not going to say relax because they're going to go out and try to win every game, but he can actually really put out some good tape without – like I said, overdoing it, you know, getting that, getting having too much pressure because the Auburn Tigers they don't play, especially at that quarterback position. They're looking for the next Cam Newton. They're looking for the next great quarterback at Auburn. They want to get that offense running and gunning them under Gus. And if you get under the center and you're not producing, they'll be ready to yank you out. And that's not what Kelly Bryant wanted. He ends up at Missouri. I think I think that was a good spot for him. Yeah, so we got Vernon Speak Sports coming in. You're watching NMD TV, guys. Where we talk college football 24-7. We're actually headed into the dead period. And um, the dead period has been um, – it's, it's going to be a tough one to get through. You know, I feel like the fall camp, the start of fall camp is um, – Close, but yet so far away. T. Davis says, so about Auburn, does Gus really deserve the hate he gets? I mean, he does have up and down seasons, but when you are the coach in the SEC, you're always compared to Bama. Hold on, Vernon, go ahead and call in and let's get it, let's get it popping. Go, Vernon, go ahead and call in and let's get it popping. Vernon speaks sports. We're talking Auburn football today. And that's the question that I want to talk about. I want to talk about the pressures that on Gus and it, you know, and it, it's due to Gus having success. It, you know, he. But they gave him the contract. He played his cards right. We're going to get Vernon Speak Sports on the line here to discuss it. Do me a favor, make sure you hit that like video. This is going to help 
bring people into the chat let's see how many likes we're sitting at right now while we get Vernon on the line let's go we got 11 watching we got six likes let's get 11 watching 11 watching six likes let's get up to let's get up to 20 likes today let's get up to 20 likes we got to set some goals up in here in tv um just some current events the ncaa will be tightening up on the hardship waivers nmd tv what's up what's going on guys it's bernie speaks for auburn uh, just call it in to NMD TV, man. Uh, appreciate you inviting me on the show tonight, brother. Hey, no problem, and I appreciate you taking time out of your day uh, to come on to the show. Real quick, before we get going, go ahead and tell the people what you do for YouTube, Vernon. Well, what I do for YouTube, man, I talk about Auburn football like it's nobody's business on my channel. In the Deep South, college football is king, and in the plains of Auburn, the battle cry is War Eagle on my channel. For all the Auburn fans out there, it's always great to be an Auburn Tiger War Eagle. Okay, okay, let's get right into it. The chat's already popping off with a couple questions. Um, but let, let's start with, um, you know, recently Gus Malzahn got some criticism because uh, um, Jerry Steedham didn't have the greatest, uh, didn't, didn't get drafted where a lot of people thought that he was going to get drafted. So I want you to kind of touch base on that because somebody brought it up in the chat. Yes, sir. Now, see, Jared Stidham, for, for, even upon his arrival, you know, they, they were listing Jared Stidham as a dual threat quarterback. Now, when I looked at Jared Stidham on video footage before he arrived on campus, for whatever reason, maybe I was just looking at different video footage, but I didn't see a – legit dual threat quarterback. I saw uh, what we eventually saw out of Jared Stidham as a guy that can run the football, but that's not his prototype as a quarterback. Now, I think what happened in that situation, you talk about Chip, Chip Lindsey and Gus Malzahn kind of sort of at odds at what they wanted to do philosophy-wise with Auburn as far as the offense goes. So that's where Jared Stidham kind of fell you know, in between the cracks. I think the best thing that could have happened to him was getting drafted by the uh, New England Patriots. Mm -hmm. And I think you will see uh, what will accent what, what will eventually eventually accentuate Jared Sidham's uh, talent. I just don't think he had a chance to accentuate his true talent based on what Auburn likes to do with that run pass option. So, so what, do you think it was Gus's fault? I mean, you know, because the I forget the guy's name, but the guy on his podcast was basically blaming Gus uh, Malzahn, even saying that Jerry would have done better if he would have just stayed at Baylor. See, here's the thing. you got to think about the subculture of Auburn fans. There's, there's a subculture of Auburn fans that Gus Malzahn can win the national championship this year, and it will still be – they will find something in that game to say, well, Gus almost cost us that game. You know what I'm saying? There's a subculture of Auburn fan base that just, just – they don't. It doesn't matter. They don't like Gus. They don't. Whoa, 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 whoa. The fan base doesn't like Gus. Uh, uh. I didn't say the whole fan base. I said there is a subculture. Okay. Okay. In the, in the Auburn fan base, that no matter what happens, uh, like, like let's just say for example, if a player uh, hits the transfer portal, oh, it's Gus' fault. <laughs> or if, or if a uh, you know, like say for instance, we'll use the. Mississippi State game, for example, where it was more so execution, and there's a lot of coaching in there too. That thing is just fought as well. So you you have a subculture of of the Auburn fan base that if things go wrong, Gus is going to be at the the, the is going to get the bad end of the stick. Now, rightfully so, I understand, but we got to be mindful of this. This the the co the head coach is not, you know always the reason for I mean sometimes things just happen sometimes you know the ball just doesn't bounce your way but you'll see it if you really look at Twitter and, and if something goes wrong I guarantee you they are ripping guts apart promise you okay so okay so do you think Gus deserves to be on the hot seat and is he on the hot seat 
this upcoming season? Now, in my honest opinion, you know, we got to look at the, the the track record here between 2013 and now. You got to think about the fact that Gus and I'm and and all the fans out there, don't get me wrong. I'm not giving Gus a pass because this Joker makes a lot of money, a lot. But we also still have to look at where he came from as well. You're talking about majority of his career as a high school coach. You can look it up on Wikipedia. Compare Gus's track record to Auburn versus Kirby Smart track record to Georgia. Gus Malzahn did not have the luxury of having the type of training that, say, Kirby Smart has had. So he's he's had to literally learn on the job. Now, yes, he – I'll say this, uh, NMD. If he doesn't win this year with the squad that he has, then hot seat talk needs – I'm talking about his seat needs to be steaming hot. And if you want to, we can explain that in detail when we talk about positions and we talk about different things. You know, if Gus Malzahn can't get it done with the with the roster that he has coming up in 2019, legitimate hot seat talk really needs to need to start. I'm talking about that seat needs to be steaming hot. He needs it needs to be so hot that it's hot when he's standing up. Okay. He don't get it done this year. Okay, okay, and we're, we're going to break down the schedule a little bit later on in the conversation, but how many games does he need to win to stay off the hot seat? I mean, you... you... Now, see, here's the, th- here's the thing in the SEC. You know, like my man, uh, 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 what's his name, uh, Pate said, uh, Josh Pate over there at the late kick, yeah, he him... said that there's only, so m- there's only so many wins to go around, for example. I don't think you can justifiably put a win-loss total on Gus Malzahn's uh, season this year, but I think you need to take you need to look at the opportunities taken advantage of. For example, if you're up against LSU by more than two scores with five minutes left in the game, you can't lose that game. That's the that's the kind of stuff that gets you on the hot seat. If you go into the Mississippi State game like Auburn did last year anemic on offense with an opportunity to possibly win that game, you lose to a beatable team 23 to 9, that's the stuff that gets you on the hot seat. You go into Tennessee, arguably one of the worst teams in the SEC last year. You go into that game, you allow Tennessee to beat you 30 to 24. Inexplicably, those are the things that get you on the hot seat. So when you look at this season, Gus Malzahn has to win the winnable. Now you talk about Alabama and Georgia. That's a that's either a split, or you might even lose those two. Those are two very very good football teams with probably two arguably two of the best rosters in college football. Right, right. Let's the game, let's let's, oh, let's wait, not sorry. let's not let's not break down the schedule just yet. But I, but I I want so you're so what you're saying is we're not going to put a win total on it, but it's going to be how you take those losses. Oh yeah, exactly. exactly. Okay, okay, okay. And um, it's gonna be interesting, man. Cause I feel like at the end of the year, um, Gus Malzahn and his contract and what needs to happen always gets popped up. But his first big decision is who's gonna be the starting quarterback. So me and you, we've discussed this um, at nauseum over and over again. But let's go one more time. Who does Vernon Speak Sports think should start Week One versus Oregon? Right out of the gate, I got to go with experience. I like Joey Gatewood, and I like his what he has shown uh, even in the spring game. His passing game wasn't, you know, as you know elite as a lot of the fans would like to believe. But what a lot of fans don't don't take into account in the spring game, those quarterbacks can't be contacted. And when you are run past mm. option quarterback, a lot of your ability to create passing lanes is based on how you effectively run the run pass option. I think from a physicality standpoint, going into a power five, uh, Pac-12, Oregon, who has aspirations to get themselves back into relevancy in the Pac-12 conference as well as college football, not winning a, um, you know, not winning a Pac-12 championship since 2014. They are really going to come with uh, aspirations to win that football game and put the Pac-12 on the map. So with all of that in mind, I think you want to go with the more experienced quarterback, who is Joy Gatewood. Uh, I think once the run-pass option gets going, 
it will create the, the necessary passing lanes that uh, need to happen uh, for him to be effective. And, you know, unless he just gets out there and, and pulls a Jeremy Johnson from 2015, mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. just think Joey Gatewood is just your best bet to start the season off with. Okay, well, um, and, and I'm in agreement to that. I think, you know, people, I, I hate to compare players with other players and things like that, um, like players, like a player now in college to a Heisman Trophy winner, like people are comparing Joey Gatewood with Cam Newton. I think that that's putting a lot of pressure on a young kid. But when you see him play, it's it's hard not to bring up that comparison. But let's not forget about how good Bo Nix is. And can you really just let the people who don't know, can you break down Bo Nix as a prospect? And what would he bring as a starting quarterback to the Auburn offense? I'm gonna go ahead and tell you like this: is uh, Joey Gatewood isn't in the picture. This was not. This would not even be a quarterback battle. The only reason why we talked about this ad nauseum, as you you, you coined the phrase, if Joey if Joey Gatewood wasn't there, Bo Nix would be your starter, arguably. Um, well, hands down, not arguably, hands down. One of the things that I love about Bo Nix is even though he's a freshman quarterback, you could tell based on his posture, he has the command to run in a power five offense. One, he wants to do it. Two, he has a legacy. His father played at Auburn. And three, he has some of the most uh, fundamental assets that a true freshman quarterback could possibly have. Maybe not quite like Trevor Lawrence, but I guarantee you, if you give Bo Nix the keys to the ship, he's going to make it happen. So even if Gus Malzahn decides to go with uh, Bo Nix, I think it it wouldn't be a, a terrible decision. Because Bo Nix makes very good decisions. One thing about him, he's not necessarily the prototypical dual threat quarterback. He's a pro style quarterback with high level dual threat tendencies. If the play calls for a pass, Bo Nix is going to stretch that play all the way through to the end until it's possible that he can complete that pass. Kind of like your boy Baker Mayfield from Oklahoma. He also has some not. Not as erratic, not as erratic, but he had some Johnny Manziel tendencies. I compared, I compared him to Johnny Manziel, but I probably errantly, but he's more so like a Baker Mayfield. Um, I, I really think if it came down to it, if Bo Nix was the more experienced quarterback, Joey Gatewood would have to hit the transfer portal. Man, you just brought up when when breaking down Bo Nix, you just brought up Trevor Lawrence, Baker Mayfield, and um, and uh, Johnny Manziel, and, and those are uh, tough shoes to fill. But um, I'm excited to see who they decide to throw out there um, week one because, like you uh, like you said, it's Oregon. They're going to come out there and game busters. There's no tune up game. It's you just got to go right there in a the fire. So we've talked. We talk a lot about the quarterback position, but. What's a position that – what's the most interesting position um, on the Auburn roster? Rather, besides quarterback, whether there's a quarterback battle or they've surprised you over the spring or they need to improve, what would you say? I'll say this, man. Uh, a position that I'm very concerned about is the, is, is the secondary. Mm. And, the most, and the most notable position in the secondary is the field cornerback position. Now, a lot of folks, just to, just to educate you real quick. Go ahead and break it down. Yeah, the field cornerback is the guy that's cut, is, is usually your best cornerback on the field. Um, usually it's like, say, in Georgia, DeAndre Baker. He covered that whole side. You were not throwing that ball to his side of the field. Uh, back in the day, you know, you had Champ Bailey, for example, at Georgia. He was a field cornerback. So you ain't throwing to his side of the field. Auburn right now has two guys at the field cornerback position both of whom have been converted position-wise. Noah Ipanagany was a former wide receiver, and he is now the field cornerback for Auburn. He did a great job. I think I think he's probably one of the best conversions in the Gus Malzahn era, and I think he will do well. The only issue that I have with that is his current backup, which is Devin Barrett. Devin Barrett, a running back out of Florida. Uh, he's been played numerous positions at Auburn, so they've thrown him as the uh, backup. Noah Igbenogany. I'm not at all comfortable with that in the event that, say, Noah Igbenogany needs a reserve 
or in the event that Noah Igbenogany gets hurt. But what I do like is the fact that you have a guy coming out of Griffin, Georgia, uh, out of Spalding High School, uh, Zion Puckett, who is a four-star recruit and could readily take at least Devin Barrett's position at the boundary quarterback. I mean, cornerback. Now, here's the good news. Auburn also has another guy, Christian Tutt, who can play any position on in the secondary, who is now playing nickel, which I'm glad of, because if we were, if, if Auburn would have put Jabari Davis back in that position, Jabari Davis would have been grossly out of position. Jabari Davis is actually going to be playing the boundary cornerback, which is a very safe place for him because he's very fast. And you know with fast guys, sometimes they misutilize their speed. But if you put him over there at that boundary cornerback position, his speed will have to be disciplined because of the position that he's playing. So right now, the, 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 the secondary for Auburn is not necessarily a concern, but I do have some depth issues, and I do have some that second team issue with the secondary. Okay, okay. And um, we saw in the spring game they gave up a couple big plays to the wide receiving core. And um, I want to say, I don't want to misquote anybody, but I, I believe uh, some people are saying that this Auburn receiving core could be one of the best in the nation. Uh, what's your thoughts on the wide receiving core? Now, when we talk about the wide receiver position, there's so many variations of what Gus Malzahn likes to do with his receivers. He has these little fancy names for He has his X9 spot. That's the, that's the slot receiver. Big, all that stuff. We, we, we want to get into all that. But the thing is, Gus Malzahn is in a position even better than the 2013 season. He has so many options as to what he can do variation-wise. And when you get a guy, a mastermind offensive coordinator and play caller like Gus Malzahn, you just can't give this guy too many toys to play with because you're not going to be able to prepare for it. Now, one thing I like is Seth Williams. Seth Williams, a four-star star recruit out of um, Iron, uh, not Irondale, Cottondale, ironically, went to Paul W. Bryant High School. This is a school in Alabama. Seth Williams, a true, a true freshman last year, immediate impact, had 500 yards last year. I think he's going to be your lead receiver. Then you factor in guys like Anthony Schwartz. Man, this guy's like the fastest human being in maybe the world. He's got a gold medal somewhere. He also is on the track team for the Auburn Tigers. Also, you look at the fact that Auburn went to the transfer portal and got Zach Farrar out of Youngtown State, who is also going to be an intermediate threat. He's a big guy. He likes to run the intermediate routes and also is a deep threat as well. Now, another thing you got to look at from the big guys is that Gus Malzahn runs the run pass option and the wide receivers are very active in blocking. So I think Zach Farrar, Seth Williams, and also uh, Sal Canella will be effective in this particular part of the football field as well. So if you want to say that Auburn is wide receiver you, I wouldn't give them that just yet. Yeah, hold up but, they, but, the, but these guys are, are going to be very talented and they're going to be very versatile in the effect and, and the, the type of uh, anxiety that they can cause on opposing defense. All right, all right, guys. We're talking to Vernon Speaks Sports. Make sure you check out his YouTube channel. I'll make sure I put the link in the description um, at the bottom of this. Make sure you hit that like button. Um, and, you know, we just talked about the receivers. We've talked about the the quarterbacks. And it's, it's said that Gus is taking over the play calling. Um, do you like that? Are you excited about that? Or how do you feel about it? I'm going to tell you like this. I've been kind of sort of um, watching Gus Malzahn as a, coach, as a play caller since his arrival at Auburn in 2009 and have been thoroughly impressed with how he's been able to take advantage of the personnel that is, has been given to him. A lot of people like to call this a high school uh, offense. Now, in my honest opinion, I can't call a the, the production that I see out of Gus Malzahn's offense, the high school offense. I think that's mindless to say. Uh, you talk about in 2013, you have a quarterback that runs 4,000 yards. You also have another running back in Trey Mason that runs for 1,800 yards. And just the list goes on and on. Against Alabama, you know, being able to pretty much score at will. Matter of fact, in 2014, Gus Malzahn put up almost 600 yards on Alabama and 44 points, although in a losing effort, 
Alabama is not a, you know, a second tier kind of defense. So when I find out, as a matter of fact, in the Music City Bowl, all replaced Purdue, right? This is when right. I really started to get serious about uh, YouTube and covering Auburn because I used to do it real serious on Facebook. But I, I did a prediction show on the Auburn and Purdue game. And when I found out that Gus Malzahn was going to be calling plays, I knew Purdue did not have a single chance in this game. I actually predicted all, that Auburn would win this game 39-16, to 16, something along those lines. And as I was watching the game, the, the Music City Bowl, I'm talking about I'm chuckling the whole time because I knew Purdue was not going to be ready for the, the what Gus Malzahn had uh, for them. They had no way to prepare for it, just like going into 2019. I think Gus Malzahn needed to get back to what made him successful in the first place. I know you want to be in, you know, you're looking over at Tuscaloosa, you're looking at Nick Saban as a CEO kind of coach, being able to delegate and blah, blah, blah. But Gus Malzahn, calling plays is your niche. I guarantee you, here's what, here's what I want to uh, piggyback on as well. You know, Alan Green, the, the athletic director for Auburn, said that he met with Gus Malzahn once a week. And what I'm thinking of, okay, if your high-level manager is meeting with you every week, he's asking some questions. Mm-hmm. And he's probably asking you some questions like, hey, Gus, you know what? I'm, 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 I'm trying to dissect this thing. I'm trying to put you in the best situation to be successful. If I may ask you, when you were successful as a coach, whether it was a coordinator or whether it was a head coach, what were you doing when you were the most successful? And Gus probably sat there and thought about it. You know what? I was calling plays. And when you talk about Gus Malzahn calling plays, this is what you get. You get a whole bunch of yards. You get a whole bunch of points. And most important for an elite defense that Auburn has coming back, you get time of possession. So let me ask you this. So why do you give it up? Why do you give up play calling in the first place? Well, every now and then, when you are trying to find your way in whatever field of endeavor that you're doing, sometimes you look at, look away from what works for you, and you look at what works for somebody else. Mm. And then you make certain decisions to mm. say, well, you know what? Maybe I need to be a CEO type, too. But see, you can't be a CEO type when you know your claim to fame is calling offenses, and with your mental stratosphere, you know that you're not going to be comfortable with any offense other than yours. So you're going to micromanage, and you're going to find, wind up having situations like what Gus had with Rhett Lashley. That's why he probably jumped ship. Then you get a situation like with Chip Lindsey, where you're still trying to have your hand in the offense, and it's like, hey, man, I want to run my offense, but Gus is like, no, your offense doesn't work. My offense is the one that works. So then you have the musical chairs, and then you have games where you only have 225 yards. And if Lindsay's now down at Troy, and now you bring in Kenny Dillingham for Auburn, and hey, Kenny, you run the offense. You, uh, you know, you 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 uh, you know, develop the quarterback. Hey, just let me handle the play call, and I got it. Okay, okay, and uh, I agree with that, man. I think just kind of what you spoke of. I think sometimes we see somebody else doing something, and like you said, instead of sticking true to what what's best for us we say well Vern is doing this i should do this you know what i'm saying so right, right. That, so not only is it, we talking football we giving out life lessons too here uh you know vernon over here dropping knowledge for us uh vernon uh, vernon speaks sports um tell me about owen papo is he the real deal is he gonna come out um you know 10 tackles a game really um making a statement on that defense or is it going to take him a while to get acclimated or do you think he's an out of the gate um player the impact player now here's the deal with owen papo a five-star recruit out of grayson georgia if any of you guys know where grayson georgia is it's in gwinnett county georgia now if you know about gwinnett county they produce some of the best athletes in the country owen papo none other one of those guys Owen Papo, you look at him on video footage, he is arguably one of the better linebacker recruits here in recent Auburn history, and for good reason. He has a lot of range. 
Um, he has a lot of IQ and instinct for the football game. And he's a, despite his uh, elite recruiting thrill, he has a real interesting level of humility. I think he's going to be a guy that's going to be an instant impact from a leadership standpoint. Because, see, what a lot of people don't get is, as a linebacker, you are a leader of the defense because you have, you're have standing up so you can see everything that's going on. So you have to have that law of navigation to where you can kind of get guys in position and think, I think Owen Tackle will eventually be that guy because he loves the game. But more than anything else, you know, outside of his physicality, he appears to be an astute student of the game. Now, let me tell you this. I think Owen Papel, if he doesn't necessarily start against Oregon, mm. you're going to see him on the football field or in the spring game. You saw him a whole lot. Matter of fact, I couldn't tell who was who. You know, I had to kind of look at it like, okay, but so number 10 is Owen. Okay, so that's, that's Owen Papel. When I spotted him out, he had such an, an, an instinct to get to the football, fighting through tackles. You know, I think he will be – arguably a household name for Auburn. I, you know, I don't want to say the Oregon game because I don't I, I don't know, but, you know, I was actually talking to one of the parents of a current football player, and needless to say, he is definitely in the rotation to be a high-impact player this year. I'm not going to put the player out there or his parent and nothing like that, but Owen Papo is going to play. I'll just put that out there. Okay, okay, and I think a lot of people wondering how did y'all get them get him from Georgia? How, how did that happen? Seeing the streak that Kirby's been on. Well, one of the things you got to look at is Georgia. You know, they do have a high, you know, a high impact, high level player at you know, you know, with what they're doing over there. I think Kirby Smart is doing an excellent job of recruiting. Uh, he's bringing some of the best players in the country over there to the Georgia Bulldogs. But at the same time, as a player, every now and then, you want to look at where you can have it, not only an immediate impact, but a lasting impact. You probably just didn't want to get over there in Georgia and wind up, you know, kind of, uh, you know, getting lo- either, either getting lost in the shuffle or maybe with his humility, he wasn't necessarily trying to go where it's already happening. He wanted to go somewhere where he can make actually make a difference. Okay, okay. And uh, I like that. I mean, that's the thing about recruiting is when it comes down to, you know, the person you're recruiting, you never know what type of personality they have. Maybe they want to go to um, some, a team that's not, that hasn't done great, and they want to turn that around. Or maybe, you know, Bo Nix – Instead of him saying, I want to go to where my father played, maybe I want to blaze my own trail. So that's why you never know what a kid's thinking. But I do, I will mm-hmm. say that's an amazing uh, pickup for Auburn. And uh, I'm excited to see what he does this year. So let's take a look at the schedule here. You know, um, right out the gate, you got Oregon. Um, kind of, Kind of give me a... Um, a breakdown of your schedule. First, first, tell me this: Are there any <laughs> trap games? Bless you. Are there any trap games in this uh, Auburn schedule? Maybe in Arkansas, maybe a Ole Miss. You know. See, see, here, here are the typical trap games for Auburn. Uh, the typical trap game is Mississippi State. Um, if you think about Mississippi State back in 2014, Auburn has aspirations to get back into the college, well, the, first, the inaugural college football playoff. Um, you know, they, they're thinking, hey, you know, we came a few seconds away from beating Florida State. Have a big-time game over in Starkville, Mississippi, with the cowbells and all that stuff going on. Um, Auburn makes every mistake possible, loses to Mississippi State. Fast forward. To 2015, Auburn loses to Mississippi State again. Mississippi State has proven to be the, the unsung nemesis uh, for the Auburn Tigers. That's a game that I would definitely look at as a potential trap game for Auburn because that's how it has been historically, at least for the last few years. You can think about last year. Auburn, I think, a better team than Mississippi State. 
goes in that game somewhat unprepared, whatever you want to call it, loses inexplicably uh, 23 to 9. So I think if you got a trap game, Mississippi State to me has always been kind of a scary game for Auburn. Okay, so we're looking at Mississippi State. Um, what's gonna what's Auburn's record next year? I'm looking at nine wins for the Tigers. Nine you know, wins. At not nine wins and maybe stealing one down in Baton Rouge. Man, we gotta get more from them. But we have Auburn has not won in Baton Rouge since I was a second semester transfer from Alabama A and M to Auburn since nineteen ninety nine. Almost twenty years since we won in Baton Rouge. Dang. So I think that is that is a game that Auburn has to win. Of course, a lot of folks in the college world are big on LSU, and for good reason. I think LSU and Joe Burrows has. I, I, I'm, I'm a fan of Joe Burrows. I don't care what y'all say. I'm, this I, kid has heart. This kid will make it happen. He will put his body, his everything on the line to do it for LSU, and I think he has a supporting cast around him. But I think Auburn's experience, though. That's what a lot of people are not taking into account. Auburn has some has a very unique level of experience that you can. I don't care how many how many stars you have, five star four, because we're big on the five star four star deals now. But Auburn has experience, so I think Auburn has the ability to has the roster um, to make some very very unique things happen this year. Okay, um, let me ask you this. Um, and you bring it up that LSU game, you you guys finish on a stretch of Texas A&M, who under Jimbo Fisher, although they did lose a lot of people on their defense, they're supposed to be pretty good this year. Kelly Mon supposed to be getting better. Florida, people are high on Florida. Of course, I'm not, but a lot of people are high on Florida. Um, LSU, Auburn. Or LSU, Georgia, and Alabama. That's how you guys finish the season. Five, those See, five straight games. So here's the situation. If you look back at the stretch between, in 2018, you look at the stretch between Mississippi State and Alabama. One, Auburn's time of possession was really, really abysmal. You're talking about an average of about 20 minutes. I'm, I'm, I'm actually being generous, giving Auburn an average time of possession of 20 minutes per game, basically. Also, you talk about offensive production of less than 225 yards against Texas A&M and still wins the football game, which is inexplicable in and of itself. Here's what I think will be a different factor for the Tigers. When Auburn can move the football which I, I'm almost certain will happen under the Gus Malzahn call offense, that will change the narrative with all of these different uh, predictions. I'm not going to be bold and say, yeah, you, you know, you're going to go undefeated, but at the same time, with an Auburn offense that can move the football, you see what happened in 2016. Once the Auburn offense got going, Auburn was in a position going into the Georgia game to being po quite possibly the first two lost teams in the college football playoff era to have an opportunity to potentially make that happen. Didn't do it, but at the same time, once the Auburn offense gets going, you talk about a defense who stayed on the field pretty much the whole game in 2018, although surrendering an average of 400 plus yards per game and 28 points per game, the season average for the Tigers was only about 19 points per game. Now, a lot of that was due to the Alabama game in which they surrendered 52 points. So, I believe with what Auburn has coming back, Derrick Brown returns, of course. Then you have a lot more athleticism at the linebacker position. Auburn is in a very unique position to really, really shock some folks this year. Okay, so you look at that five-game stretch. Um, at Texas A&M, at Florida, at LSU, you get Georgia and Alabama at home. Just out of those five games, what do you? How many of those games do you think you win? Now, if I'm if I'm looking at it from a fan standpoint, I say two. <laughs> because a lot of the fans are not really 
really giving Auburn a chance, and it's because it's, it's like it's, it's such a I'm, 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 I'm I want to know from your perspective. You you, you now, know now, now Auburn like nobody's now, business. Now, now from my perspective and what I have seen historically with the Gus Malzahn offense, and now actually having a defense to you know uh, to unite with a what should be a very very good offense. I'm thinking Auburn, you know, if you look at the stretch between um, Texas A&M and LSU, if it goes the way I visually see this thing going, the Oregon game, a wild card, I would not be shocked if Auburn goes into Baton Rouge undefeated. That's a bold statement. But that's something that I'm potentially seeing with all the experience with all with the Auburn Tigers. I would not be shocked if Auburn goes into that LSU game undefeated. Yeah. And then and then and then you know my 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 thing is you go into the LSU game and you just let the chips fall as they may because that's when things get real real after that. Because you talked about it even early in the show. You, okay, Florida, you're not big on, and I know why you're not big on it because their offensive line is is suspect at the moment, and they have a lot of inexperience. Mississippi State lost uh, Nick Fitzgerald, who replaces him. Also, Texas A&M lost a lot as well, and they want to, you know, bring stock in the Kellen, uh, Kellen Mond, but the defensive line for Auburn gave Kellen Mond trouble that whole game. So I would not, I'm telling you, man, I would not be shocked if Auburn is undefeated or with one loss at worst going into LSU with a shot to make a make some noise down the stretch. Okay, and and I agree with you with that. You know, those first couple games, I mean, you're playing Oregon and then the rest of those games, I could I could pick Auburn to win those games. Um and I could see them going into that last stretch undefeated. But my question to you is Texas A&M, Florida, LSU, Georgia and Alabama, how many games of those do you win, and how many do you lose those last five games? <laughs> now, now, when you say the last five games, you're talking about after the LSU game? I'm talking about um, – wait, I think I was looking at this wrong. I may be looking at the schedule wrong. My bad, my bad. I'm looking at the – my bad. I was reading the schedule wrong. How they got it set up. My bad. Um, I okay. was. I it was my. I was reading this as y'all were playing those those games in a row. Okay, gotcha. And I was thinking, wow, that is a tough stretch. But I will still ask you the question: Out of Texas A and M, you play Texas A and M, Florida, LSU, Georgia, and Alabama. Out of those games, how many do you think you can win, and how many do you lose? Worst case scenario, how many games is that? Four? Five. Uh, okay, Texas A&M, five. Florida, LSU, Auburn, and Alabama. I'll tell, I tell you what. LSU is the game that I feel that if Auburn is going to lose the game, historically speaking, that will be the one. And you split at best, because you got to think, Georgia and Alabama are, are have two of the most talented rosters in the country. But the good news is you have those guys at home. So you split the Alabama, you split the Alabama and or Georgia game, and then if some things happen in your way, you win it. But just off the top of my head, I say you go three and two in that stretch. Okay. 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 Um, before we get you out of here, we got a couple questions in the chat. And, um, you know, my fan base, you know, I'm a Miami Hurricane, so I have a lot of uh, Miami Hurricanes uh, fans in the chat. I got Florida people in the chat. Um, so I'm going to ask you to end with this. Um, an unbiased um, football analyst and Vernon, who do you think will win versus Miami and Florida, your prediction? And then who do you think should be the starting quarterback for Miami in that game? You have the floor. Okay, so so you have Kate Martell and the – you still got Nick Perry and the right? Yeah, Nikosi Perry, yes, sir. Nikosi Perry, there you go. All right, so 
my thing is this. Uh, you know, a lot of folks are still riding high off of Florida State. I mean, off of Florida's late stretch um, with Florida State. They pretty much whooped them. Where, where did they play that game? The Tallahassee? They whooped Florida State in uh, Tallahassee, which doesn't really, you know, hold. Everybody whooped Florida State. That's what I'm saying. And then you take on, I actually watched that Florida and Michigan game just the other day. And I understand why the Florida fan base is, you know, riding high off of the huge win over over Michigan. However, you know, there were a lot of miscues in that game Michigan-wise as well. well. I don't want to say, you know, be elementary and say that Michigan didn't show up because I think that's just, you know, just kind of a a slap in the face to say that about a, a Power 5 team going into a bowl game. But I think, you know, when we go into the preseason predictions, I think we put too much stock in teams' performances in these bowl games. I like Miami. And, I, and, and I'll say this. I don't even like Miami just because I've been, you know, an affiliate of the NMD TV. I've always said that Miami has the roster. They have the talent to push Florida the same way that LSU pushed y'all last year. A lot of people are not giving Miami a single chance to win this this football game. Mm. But what you got is you. But what, what, what you got is you got to think about mentality. You got to think about resurgence. You got to think about the fact that as as bad as Miami as we would like to think Miami was last year, still managed with a with a brand new head coach late in the in the recruiting stretch, still managed a top thirty recruiting class. A lot of people laugh at that. But at the same time, that was a huge feat for Miami. So when I look at this game against, uh, you know, Miami, it wasn't the World Camp Classic or whatever down in uh, Orlando. Yeah. Man, and I'm not saying this because this is a Miami page, but you can ink it right here. Miami beats Florida. Mm. Miami beats Miami beat Florida. Mm. I, just don't, I, I just don't think Florida is who the media <laughs> thinks they are. And sometimes the media gets it wrong because sometimes the media, I'm not trying to be a, a jerk about this, but sometimes the media is lazy in their analysis. You're talking about a team where Georgia beat Florida all over the field. They put their reserves in at the end of the game. Beat them down. Beat them down. You know what I'm saying? And then you want to you wanna use uh, a game against Michigan as your, uh, your stock, and then you, your offensive line is shaky. Man, Miami should win this game. And I'm just, like I said, I'm, I've been thinking this. This has been my intuition. And I'm not saying this because I'm on a Miami site because I have no dog in the fight either way. But if Miami beats Florida, y'all better not come up on here talking being shot because it can happen. Oh, man. Felipe Franks, I mean, yeah, he's an okay quarterback. He's like got a lot of great receivers. Your offensive line... See, here's the thing. You talked about this in your show the other day, and I don't, I don't want to get long-winded. I think I got one more minute left. It's okay. It's okay. You, talked about, you talked about this last a couple of days ago. Miami, outside of the Clemson game, were pretty much in most of the games that they played. So I think your record was, what, like 7-8-6 and eight and six or something like that last year? 7-6. Seven 7-6. And six. Seven and six. You're talking about some games that could go either way. And you're also talking about a Florida team in the SEC East who, I mean, who you got in the SEC East other than Georgia? You got Vanderbilt, you know, Vanderbilt, Kentucky, South Carolina. Uh, They stole one from LSU. I'm not necessarily saying that I'm disrespecting Florida, but, you know, they're going to have to show me something. And right now, I just don't believe they've shown me enough to say that they're elite enough to just straight up say that you're going to beat a – uh, traditional powerhouse in Miami that has a brand new attitude and is coming into the 2019 season under uh, Manny Diaz that is not playing. So I, I pick Miami, man. I, I pick them, and I pick them bold face. All right, that's what I like to hear, man. That's what I like to hear. Uh, D. Rav Lee says, uh, "Tell Vernon he just earned him a new subscriber." So that's good, man. Um, everybody, go that's show. Fun, man. My boy Vernon, um, some love. Subscribe to his channel. Um, Vernon, hey, man, I appreciate it so much. 
And um, let's definitely do this again, man. I'd like to do this a lot and definitely. Uh, oh, yeah, man. I'm going to tell you, uh, guys out there, uh, you know, NMD TV, you got to support uh, this brother, man. He's really, really grinding. As a matter of fact, uh, he was a real inspiration uh, for me to, to say, hey, man, let me go on and pursue this thing as well. Uh, it's been nothing but love ever since. He's been a great mentor in the uh, YouTube uh, game, so to speak. And also, I want to let you guys know that I'm also a moderator uh, for NMD TV, so a, a firm supporter uh, for NMD TV and uh, the incentive that you got going on here, man. Hey, I love it. I absolutely love it, man. All right, Vernon, I appreciate it, man. And um, uh, we got Josh up next. I'm going to end yes, this, sir, and, we'll, and, we'll, and we'll be back, man. Thanks a lot, Vernon. All right, we'll talk to you soon, baby. War Eagles.